Okay, so the AFL trade period is approaching after finals, of course. And I was thinking of doing a video talking about the biggest players in this year's trade period for which teams this particular offseason shapes as being hugely influential on where they're at as a footy club. And then I thought, scrap that, let's talk about all of them in a tier maker. So what I'm going to do today is go through all the 18 clubs and more or less rank how important this trade period is to their short to medium term prospects as a football club. Because I think there are different layers and different tiers of answers for different footy clubs. So we're going to include them all and then get straight into it. Although while you're there, you guys have done an amazing job. I really appreciate the support in getting me really close to my goal of hitting 30,000 subscribers by grand final day. We've made up a lot of ground really recently. So I want to say thank you. If there's anyone else who wants to see footy content throughout the finals and the trade period and the draft, this would be a great channel to subscribe to. So I'd really appreciate it. Thanks. All right, let's crack into this tier maker. I'll explain it briefly if uh, you are not understanding it, but essentially we've got the four tiers. The top tier, uh, the teams for whom this is an enormous trade period, and we'll get into those. Then there's another, another tier down that's important, but perhaps there isn't as much at stake. Uh, then there's some moderate players throughout this trade period, and then there's some low key operators here who at this stage, with a fair bit of time to play out before the trade period, don't seem to be in the thick of it in terms of wheeling and dealing. So I'm gonna go through each of the 18 clubs, and as I usually like to do, I'm gonna start with one team in each tier. So for which team is there a huge trade period on the horizon? I'm going to say we can start with the Richmond Footy Club. I've done a whole video on this, and uh, the reason it's so significant for them is because they're at a bit of a crossroads with their list. You know, there's a number of players retiring who they lost. It was Grimes, Dusty, and Pickett. Those are just the retirees. And the link to some players exiting the club, such as Dan Rioli, Shea Bolton, Liam Baker, and to some extent, Jack Graham as well. So there's a huge chunk of the list potentially, you know, out the door, depending on some of the decisions they make. And that will be interesting to see how that plays out. And, you know, I think just as important as to who they decide to retain is how well they negotiate this position to maximize their draft hand this year because they've missed a few years of drafts. They've got Tasmania around the corner. This is the time to cash in. But I also think it'd be worth watching to see how conservative they are or how aggressive they are because, you know, gutting the football club of all their experience and established players might also have some adverse effects. So I think there is a clear number one answer here for Richmond. The decisions they make in this trade period will affect them for some time. So I think that's a no-brainer to start this off. Who is a very low-key operator this trade period? Well, at the moment, would you probably say Sydney? I would probably put Sydney, I think. You know, I think they were loosely linked to Tom Barris for a little while there. That didn't really gain any momentum. That was more of a last year thing. Jake Stringer is one that has popped up in more recent times. And I suppose that would be somewhat of a decent deal, but generally speaking, the link isn't massively strong. We'll see how that plays out. And they may need to make a decision on Luke Parker and decide whether he's going to stay at that football club. To be honest, I think it'd be great to see him stay. Uh, nonetheless, I think that pretty much shapes up as a very low key trade period. And again, we're talking about the trade period specifically here, not the draft. And, you know, I think they've got a lot of the pieces of the puzzle and, you know, finish the year on top. So I think they certainly count as low key. For whom does this loom as an important trade period? I would say, you know, maybe my boys, the West Coast Eagles. You know, it's an important time. You know, I suppose any phase of the rebuild is important. I suppose if we're looking at the trade period, West Coast's biggest deal that they've got on their agenda is the trade for Tom Barris, which is likely to happen with Hawthorne at some point. And their goal at the moment, their modus operandi, is to you know improve their access to the draft. So I'd say it's an important one for West Coast without being huge players, linked to a lot of smaller deals like Jack Carroll, uh, for instance, or you know Jack Graham is a somewhat small deal, medium-sized deal, whatever. There's Liam Baker. So there's a bit going on without any huge names there. West Coast need to get this right. So they're amongst a few clubs that need to get that right, but certainly do count in that category. All right, who's having a moderate trade period, do we think? Maybe Carlton? So I thought about moderate or low-key. So what are, what are Carlton's objectives? Looking past the final series, which is obviously going to consume them for a bit, but they have been linked to Dan Houston. So I'd suppose that le like lifts them up from low-key. That makes it a fairly moderate um, trade period. It could even be important for them. But the links aren't so strong and the confidence isn't so high that they're going to get Dan Houston that it probably puts them in the middle somewhere. Outside of that, you know, they've been linked to Nick Haynes loosely a little while ago now. And they're going to be looking at the draft and considering, um, you know, draft points for the Camprioli twins as well. So I don't think it's going to be a huge one from Carlton, but if they do land a Dan Houston, they could emerge as a bit more of a player as we get a little bit closer to the trade period and, you know, presumably once all those teams are eliminated from finals. So I think they probably count 
as moderate. Before we go any further, I just wanna let you guys know that this video is brought to you in a paid partnership with BetterHelp. There are a multitude of benefits to accessing something like therapy. First of all, it provides a great safe space to talk. You can share whatever is on your mind, whether it's stress or sadness, and you can have that without the fear of any judgment. And there's nothing wrong with having these conversations with friends or loved ones, but through therapy, you'd actually get guided advice from an expert. That is a trained mental health expert who is there to listen, ask questions, and help you see new perspectives. And one thing that I suspect people do is that they wait until the problems in their life reach such a level or a threshold that they feel like they then need to get therapy to fix it. Whereas perhaps you could think about therapy as a source of personal growth. You don't necessarily need to have a clinical mental health issue such as depression or anxiety before you can seek out therapy. So as I said, BetterHelp is the paid partner of this video and they're on a mission to make starting therapy easier. And getting started with BetterHelp is really easy. All you need to do is go to the link in this description or visit betterhelp.com forward slash true footy. From there, you fill out a questionnaire and in most cases, you'll get matched within a couple of days. And one of the best features about BetterHelp is that if you feel like the therapist you get isn't quite the right fit, you can switch to another one at no additional cost. If you're someone who is struggling and think you could benefit from a therapy session, go to betterhelp.com forward slash truefooty or visit the link in the description to get started. Clicking the link does support the channel, but it also gets you 10% off your first month with BetterHelp. Thanks guys, let's get back to the video. We can probably talk about Hawthorne here. We all know exactly what's going on there if you've been following the trade period anyway, but they are one of the biggest players in this space this year. As I said, already linked to Tom Barrison, I believe Josh Battle has also nominated them as his uh, destination. He's presumably gonna land there through free agency. So they've added two tall pieces to their back line that they probably lacked going into this year. and it, they're already a dangerous team. So I, I think for where they're at, they're looking to top up with a group that's really strong and connected and playing really good footy, young and talented. They bring some relatively experienced talents who plug a hole in their team. And we haven't even talked about Harry Perryman yet, who may sign there as a free agent. There's still, well, I think the fact that he's unsigned means it's still a good chance. And this could cap off an enormous trade period for the Hawks. And I include free agency in that. And um, they could seriously bolster their team for next year. And I think that puts them in the huge category. I might put the Giants in here, but probably not for super positive reasons. You could put them in moderate, but let me explain this position. So they are not really linked to anyone meaningfully. There was a bit of a flutter at Elliot Himmelberg last year. I haven't heard anything more about that. That doesn't mean that won't happen. It just means we're not hearing about it. So they'll probably maybe have a sniff at that. But other than that, then most of their concerns will be around player retention. And they have two free agents out of contract in Isaac Cumming and Harry Perriman, who I just discussed. And, you know, on top of that, there's Peatling. And perhaps, you know, they'll have to consider a deal for Nick Haynes as well. So I don't I don't know how critical Nick Haynes is to their retention, but I'd imagine Perryman coming in, and to some extent, Peatling as well, who's had a pretty good year this year. Trying to keep those guys at their footy club would be important. I'd imagine that these guys are players that they'd rather keep at this stage. I think they're all talented, slightly underrated in terms of league-wide reputation. I think they're good players. And I think GWS would like to keep them ideally. So if they can you know, maybe keeping them might be long gone at this point, but if they can be proactive in using the, the compensation picks, you know, to, to land a good draft haul, I still think it's important that they, they make use of what compensation picks they get, considering the quality of those players, even if they are likely to leave at this current point in time. What about uh, another moderate one? I'm going to put the Brisbane Lions here. Again, we haven't really heard a peep out of them. And I think, you know, you consider the fact that they're pretty mature team in contention and um, you know I think from a salary point of view probably not on the market for some big names so therefore we haven't really heard the trades into the club but I put it in moderate because once again they are faced with the important uh, process of getting enough draft points for Ashcroft and Marshall so they'll get to you know top 20 talents Levi Ashcroft considered by some the best midfield prospect in this year's draft so it's important. They will still need to make proactive moves and they've been blessed with some academy situations previously and they've done a pretty good job of making it all work. So I'll say it's moderate. I don't think it's completely low key, even though in the trade sense, they're not getting anyone in. They will probably still have to make some moves to accommodate having enough points for these players. So I think it'll be somewhat busy for them. I think Geelong is firmly in the important category here. And it's actually interesting to consider the fact that Bailey Smith might be the most talented player that moves clubs this year, depending, depending on your opinion. And I'm shooting from the hip there entirely. But I do actually really think Bailey Smith is a potential A-plus midfielder still. We've seen, you know, it's been a while since we've seen his best form. We've also seen him be an unbelievable finals player, probably earlier than we expected. 
And so there's a little bit of a, perhaps a recency bias that he's probably slipped under the public consciousness of in terms of like players to move this off season. But for where Geelong's at, if they can learn land Bailey Smith, which I believe is the most likely destination from at this point, then they have done a fantastic job of facilitating an influx of young talent. You know, they're, they're trying to bolster the young midfield and they've done great with some draft selections and, you know, trading with Gold Coast that kind of fell into their laps to some extent. But if Bailey Smith joins them, the list transition for them is looking a lot healthier. So I'm going to say this is important. It's probably more important for the Cats than is perhaps being portrayed. It's not, it's not really a story that's getting talked about a lot, at least in my perception. So I'll say it's an important one for the Cats. They need to make sure they get this right. And by get it right, I guess I just mean make sure they do land Bailey Smith. Um, and it seems like they're the major contender at this point. Let's talk about Fremantle. I think this is probably a huge one for them. Um, it's probably been a little while. Well, they, they traded in Luke Jackson, and prior to that, probably had some a poor run of success with you know trading in players from other clubs. I think the Luke Jackson one, as it currently stands, is a good deal, personally. So now they're in the thick of it again with a potentially huge offseason. Now, the, the stories around this are fluctuating, and this is only a moment in time. But as we understand it, Shea Bolton to Fremantle looks pretty likely. The Cozzy Pickett one burned bright for about a day, and now it has receded back to him more likely to be at, at Melbourne. Again, it, it remains to be seen, but they're also in the hunt for Liam Bacon. I believe they're also having a pop at Isaac Cummings. So I think they've been very proactive. They've got a whole host of first round selections for which they can use as bargaining chips to get these targets. So I think this is important for, oh, in fact, I think, I think it's huge for Fremantle because some of the talent that's linked to join that footy club is significant. And the decisions that they make now will ultimately influence the club in the short to medium term. So I think they qualify very much as a huge contender in this year's trade period. Gold Coast is probably also important. I think it's probably a little bit higher than, than moderate when you consider their aims this off season are twofold, primarily to get Dan Rioli onto their list. They'll try their best to facilitate a trade with Richmond, which may or may not happen, but they're certainly interested and I think see him as a must have. At least that's the impression I'm getting from all the reports. They also have a top, I don't know, what do you want to call it? Eight to 10, some people say top five, Prospect in this year's draft is an academy talent in Leonardo Lombard, and that is important to consider. So they need this. It is important for them to be able to facilitate a trade with Richmond that doesn't compromise their goal of getting Lombard onto the list. And I'm sure they'll make it work, but it is still important. That's two pretty high level talents to get onto your list in a single off season. I think that qualifies this as an, an important trade period for them. We probably need another low key team. You probably go St Kilda at this point. Um, you know, I think that, again, the Petrarca story came up and then it went away and it seems like he's committed to them. I've made the point previous, I thought St. Kilda would be a pretty decent contender for him considering they might have a couple of top 10 draft picks depending on what happens with the Josh battle. But generally speaking, other than battle potentially leaving, which I think is more or less out of their hands at this point, there hasn't been a lot linked to St. Kilda. Um, there's James Peatling they were linked as uh, being interested in uncontracted player without a huge profile there was a, a small link to Dylan Shield that I'd seen and again hasn't popped up for a long time now so again not a lot of noise coming out of St Kilda they might be active in the draft you'd imagine um, and then there's maybe a deal for Tim Membry going on but I think all things considered the trade period itself is not massively important for St Kilda and they are a relatively low-key player here. Adelaide is an interesting contender here, I think, because I think it's potentially quite a big trade period for them if they land Jack Lacocious and Alex Neil Bullen. They've also been linked to Isaac Cumming as well. And so I guess that, that that is pretty significant. I There's no real indication which way Isaac Cumming is leading, leaning. I think there's probably been a strong connection between him and Port Adelaide, but really we're going off a little bit of whispering there. So um, I'd say probably counts as important. I do think if there's a scenario where they land coming Lukosius and Neil Bullen, that is actually huge, but I'm not sure that the links to particularly Lukosius and Isaac coming are strong enough for me to probably put them in the top category. Does that make sense? So it's a potentially huge one for Adelaide, but I'm not too sure exactly what they're likely to come away with. I know Neil Bullen has requested a trade formally to them, and I think Lukosius is gettable for them. I'm not sure exactly if he's requested a trade at the moment. I think it's early days in that front, but it's potentially quite big for them. So I'd say it's an important trade period for Adelaide. If they, say, miss out on a Lukosius to potentially a Melbourne club or Port Adelaide or whatever, then I think that's an opportunity missed as someone who rates Jack Lukosius. North Melbourne probably count as low-key here again. I think I think when you're a team that's rebuilding, 
Um, when you're talking specifically about the trade period, there's not a lot of action there. You could say moderate, but again, the links to some of these players are not super strong. So let's be specific. They've been linked to some veteran players at other clubs. You know, they had a pop at Viney and Wines, and neither of those uh, appear to like they're going to work out. Not too sure about Luke Parker. But Jack Darling, there is a formal offer on the table. We know that. Um, I'd still say that counts as relatively low key. What they may do is be proactive with a pick split. So to summarize that briefly, North Melbourne probably are in the position where they're likely to go taller in this year's draft. I think they've taken like seven or eight first rounders um, that are midfielders in recent times. So there is logic to them, you know, potentially trading down and getting access to some tools that are genuinely later in this draft pool that are of good quality. So that is potentially quite important for them, but there isn't enough to suggest it's actually in the works at this current point in time. So I think that qualifies low key, but there isn't a lot of noise coming out of North Melbourne as to what's going to happen. So I'd say at this stage, it's low key. I do think they should seriously explore that pick split if they can get a suitable deal. Let's also put Essendon in low key. There isn't a whole lot of noise about what they're doing. I think there was a link to Joe Richards, but they're not the major contender for him. Likewise for Dan Houston, a vague link, but again, there's not a lot of connecting him to the Essendon Footy Club. They reportedly showed interest in Clayton Oliver last year. Could they you know, throw themselves into the mix again? Not a strong link there. Um, and Will Phillips is someone who at North Melbourne might be gettable, but then it was reported that he's more likely to stay at North Melbourne now. So Either way, I think there's not a lot going on in terms of Essendon's trade period, other than perhaps, you know, looking at someone like a Jake Stringer who's out of contract and apparently there's a contract standoff at the moment, so he might find another club, but there's not a lot going on at Essendon in terms of bringing players in. They will potentially have two first round draft picks this year with Isaac Carco as an NGA prospect. So, you know, important draft for sure. If they can land two quality talents in a pretty good range of the draft, in my opinion, they'll be happy. But again, it's low key. I've gone a long while without talking about Port Adelaide, who are a major contender again. Links to Harry Perriman, although that seems to be more likely to be Hawthorne at this stage. Isaac coming again, they're a pretty good contender for that. There's a three year offer on the table for Joe Richards. That is a decent chance, but again, no real indication. 50 50 from the outside looking in. They had a pop at Cozzy Pickett. Again, more likely to stay at this point. There's also a bit of interest in Jack Lacocious from what I can gather. I've also seen them linked to Riley Garcia. So now that I'm looking at it now, there is a good chance they don't land any of those players. Isaac Cumming is a decent chance from what I can tell. Again, it's 50 50 from the outside looking in. We just don't have that information right now with both of these teams in the mix of finals right now, but Perryman's not likely to go there. Joe Rich is probably unlikely. Cozzy Pickett, unlikely. Neil Bullen requested a trade to the Adelaide Crows. Lacocious, again, may or may not be high on their agenda, considering they've got a few tools up forward, in my opinion. Well, that's just factual, but in my opinion, they probably don't need Jack Lacocious. So I might actually downgrade them to importance. So it's one of those ones where if they go large and actually land all of these guys, it will be a huge trade period, particularly for a team that is not only contending right now, but contending, you'd think, for the next few years with the young nucleus of talent that they've got. A lot of young talent still in that team. And I think in a good age and experience position. So oh, that's actually a really tough one to categorize because there is a decent chance they end up with none of those players. There's not real strong links in any direction. There has been talk about Dan Houston. There is also every chance that doesn't happen at all. So I'll say important because they've got their finger in a lot of pies. At the same time, if they miss out on all those players, they're probably okay. Tough one to categorize there, Port Adelaide. That one really made me second guess myself. The Melbourne Football Club. I have done a video about them fairly recently. And I talked about how, you know, if Petrarca in particular leaves that footy club, they're a bit of a crossroads, an important decision-making point. Since I've made that video, you know, the Petrarca story has somewhat died and he's likely to stay now. I think he's more or less verbally committed to stay at the club. Great result. Cosy Pickett is also less likely to leave Melbourne than leave it. Alex Nilbourne is pretty much gone out the door. Other than that, it's actually getting pretty quiet now at Melbourne, considering the Clayton Oliver story, again, that resurfaced earlier this year. We're a little bit removed from that now. So I think it was potentially huge a week ago if there was a serious chance of them losing a bunch of players. And then I thought it was then incumbent upon them to access the draft as best as they could, get as many first-round draft picks as they could for the players they were going to potentially lose. There's a current point in time. Those stories have died right down, and Melbourne are actually... There's not actually a whole lot going on. I mean, there was a Dan Houston connection, and, and perhaps that would be a good deal if they made it happen. But again, it's just not likely enough, in my opinion, at this stage to, to say it's an important trade period for them. So it's important in the sense that they needed to keep those players, and now they have... 
as we look at the trade period a month from now, I'm gonna probably put them in moderate. There's actually not a whole stack going on with them. I would actually like to see them have a pop at Jack Lacocious. I think they could use some tall timber up forward. I know he's not a traditional key forward, but very talented player in my opinion. I think he would add something to them. We know that they had a crack at Jake Waterman and that's almost certain to not happen now. There was also some interest around James Peatling. That could happen. Um, I'll say moderate because their name has been everywhere, um, but at the end of the day, they might not actually do that much business going into the trade period this year. Now, I could offer a similar sort of narrative around the Western Bulldogs here. They're an interesting one. So at the start of the year, this, this shaped to be a crucial off-season in terms of recontracting players that they wanted to keep. Those were Bailey Smith, uh, Jamara Yugo Hagen, and Tim English. Now, Jamara and English, they've retained. I'd say Jamara is more important than English. Bailey Smith, I think we've seen for a long time coming. That deal looks like it's been going to happen for a while now. So they have to embrace the reality that he's going to be playing in different colors next year. So it's important to some extent to get a good return on that. I think they're going to cop a bit of a loss out of contract out of form before his ACL, then his ACL. But I do hope they get compensated fairly. So what that exactly looks like, I'm not too sure. You'd imagine Geelong's first round pick will be the centerpiece of the deal and probably something else on top of that. So I suppose it's important in that sense that they get compensated, but they've done a great job of recontracting a lot of these players. And someone like a Rory Lobb was linked to a move elsewhere. He's come back into form, playing well on the team. The team's going well in general. They may make a few moves to free up some depth. There's Caleb Daniel and Jack McRae have been linked to moves, but I'll say moderate because they are but likely to trade Bailey Smith, so it's not low-key. That's not a low-key move. But I think they've done a lot of their grunt work throughout the year, recontracting some of these star players. And I do think that losing Bailey Smith is a blow, but nonetheless, it's probably was always going to happen. Now, I've left Collingwood to last. They are so hard to categorize here because... I was just thinking this week, what the hell is with Collingwood being linked to every star player potentially on the move at the moment? Like that's always been the case, but they have nothing to to trade with. They have nothing. Like a lot of their best players, you know, other than the obvious few, like the Dacos um, combination and then Jordan Degoy, of course. But then you've got a lot of like older veteran guys as well without trade value. And then there's no first round draft pick this year. So the fact that they've been linked, I think it was Logan McDonald, Jamari Hagen, Bailey Smith, Christian Petrarca most recently, none of whom were free agents. Uh, there was a link to Josh Battle. It appears they've missed out on him. Um, I think that would have been great for Collingwood. But I just wanted to start that off by saying they're linked to everyone but I just don't understand in what universe they could have made any of those deals happen. So what it, what could potentially happen here for Collingwood? I think they will look at some lower level deals that's, you know, go, that's pretty much in their wheelhouse this off season without the first round draft pick. They've been linked to Alex Davies from the Gold Coast Suns. He's potentially on the move, looking for more opportunity. He's got a bit of interest from a number of clubs, but I'd imagine Collingwood will be a compelling offer for him. There's also Keane from the Adelaide Crows, who I think is contracted and may or no, may not be released, but there's a good chance that happens. So I think those are good moves when you consider Nathan Murphy retired at the start of this season. And I think they could look to bolster their young midfield talent, like outside of Dacos, who is unbelievable. The young talent behind him is far less proven. So they could look at getting some low key options like that. I'd imagine Collingwood will emerge as a major player next year. And there was a story that um, somebody had offered uh, Mac Andrew like $15 million over 10 years or something ridiculous. And my first reaction is, I bet that's Collingwood. I think he would suit them perfectly. So I suppose that puts Collingwood in low key. Their hands are a little bit tired this off season with what they can realistically achieve. It doesn't mean it's not an important one. I think they, they might not hold a first round draft pick this year, but they would still like to nail a draft pick because there is a lot of unprovenness about some of the young talent there, which is completely normal for a team that is in, has been in contention for a few years now. And of course, I am kind of excluding Nick Dacos when I say that because he's already one of the game's best players and therefore I sort of didn't categorize it as young's talent, but it's it's the supporting, the supporting band behind him. That's probably where a little bit of depth needs to be bolstered here for Collingwood. So to some extent, Every trade period is important for clubs, regardless of their goals. But I think I've done a decent job of mapping out, you know, to what extent this trade period is more important to some clubs versus others. So as always, let me know in the comments what your thoughts are on everything I've said in this video, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.